We want to welcome you to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center virtual field trip. We'll want to say a very special welcome to Thomas J. Rusk. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful winter morning. Can't tell it's winter hardly. Uh, teacher, if you're watching, you have not signed up, please do so. Go to www.towny.cc slash six dash eight registration. Sign up for it, please, so we can have a record of your attendance. Program this morning will be flow of energy. During this virtual field trip, students will recognize that radiant energy from the sun is transformed into chemical energy through the process of photosynthesis and describe the flow of energy through living systems, including food chains, food webs, and energy pyramids. Uh, Mr. Dominguez will introduce photosynthesis. Food webs will be covered by Ms. Schramm. Mr. Maris will do an owl pellet investigation. Mr. Monroe will do a program called Energy Pyramids. Students, during this program, you cannot ask us a verbal question, but you can go to www.tiny.cc slash question dash answer. Fill out a question, send it in to us. We'll be glad to answer it for you. Thank you. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Mr. Dominguez is going to tell you all about photosynthesis. Hey guys, in this portion of your virtual field trip, we are going to talk about photosynthesis. And I'm sure that a lot of you guys have already heard of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the process that plants use to produce their own food. So unlike us heterotrophs, Plants are autotrophs, meaning that they produce their own food. They don't rely on the consumption of other organisms to survive. We do. We're not photosynthetic, unfortunately. Uh, today, we are going to talk about the ingredients that make photosynthesis possible, but we will also talk about plant cells and some of the unique characteristics, some of the organelles that make photosynthesis possible. So even though plant cells are very similar to animal cells, there are some differences and those differences make photosynthesis possible. Uh, it's pretty close to springtime, so you guys will get to see a lot of photosynthesis occurring pretty soon. But in the meantime, let's talk about it. Let's get our presentation started. All right, guys, the purpose of this lab is to observe one of the products of photosynthesis, oxygen. For this lab, you will need a few items. You will need two beakers. These are two 500 milliliter beakers. These will work just fine. You will need some baking soda. This is our sodium bicarbonate. Some baby spinach. A hole punch. This is not necessary, but I like to have a Petri dish to keep my small items in. You will need some soap, some water, two syringes, so these will work just fine. Some measuring spoons, some forceps, a little dropper, and you will need some light, but using your uh, classroom's light or uh, if you're doing this from home, your home's light uh, will do just fine. I have some growing lights, which I will use. Those are not necessary, uh, but since I have them, I'm going to use them. All right, guys, our first step will be to make a sodium bicarbonate solution. And that's just a fancy way of saying some baking soda mixed with some water. And why are we uh, making this? Well, these two things are going to give me the first two ingredients I need for photosynthesis. The baking soda will create carbon dioxide, and of course, the water will provide me with the water. Uh, so let's get started. I will need about half a teaspoon of baking soda in each of the containers, the beakers. So that should be sufficient. And I'm just gonna use my forceps to mix. It'll be fine. I am also going to add one drop 
of soap. The soap is not required for photosynthesis, but this is going to reduce the surface tension of the water, which will be important later on. So let me add just one drop per beaker. That's one, two. Let's move on to the next step. All right, guys, the next step is to prep our plant material. And I like to use baby spinach. I love that green color. Now, this green color comes from that pigment that we were talking about earlier, chlorophyll. And there's different types of chlorophyll. There's chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B. Uh, there's other types of light sensitive pigments that plants utilize uh, for photosynthesis. Uh, and why is that? Well, that's because light comes in different wavelengths and it's important for plants to utilize every single bit of light, no matter in what wavelength it comes in uh, to their advantage. So uh, all I'm going to do in this step is I'm going to hole punch just a, uh, a few round pieces of spinach. So I'm gonna need five for each beaker. So one, two, three, four, five, and we'll come back for step three. All right, guys, this next step is very important, so pay close attention. I have my 10 pieces of spinach, five and five, and the way I will be able to tell uh, that photosynthesis is occurring and that oxygen is being produced is if these pieces float. However, if I were to place these pieces into each beaker right now, they would float anyway because air is trapped uh, in each of these pieces already. So I need to get rid of that trapped air. So how do I do that? Well, the next step, like I said, is very crucial. So please pay attention. All right, guys, all you need to do for this step is place five spinach pieces into one of the syringes. The other five go into the other syringe. I've also added some of that sodium bicarbonate solution and left an air pocket. That is very important because this air pocket is going to help you create a vacuum that is going to help you get rid of all that trapped air inside of our plant material. So all you have to do to get rid of the air is Hold the tip, just like so, and then pull on the syringe. This is creating a vacuum that is getting rid of that trapped air that we don't want. You're gonna have to do this until they stop floating. Okay, as you can see, my spinach pieces are still floating. That means I have to repeat this step. Now look at these spinach pieces. Most of them are already at the bottom. That means that these are close to having no air trapped in them. Repeat this until they are all at the bottom. As you can see, all of my plant material is now at the bottom of my syringe. Now it's time to place them in the beakers. All right guys, now that I've placed the plant material in our beakers, as you can see, the spinach pieces are not floating. They are at the bottom of each of the beakers. What I'm going to do is add the missing ingredient for one of the beakers. So this beaker here will get light. This beaker will be our control group and will get no light whatsoever. If no photosynthesis occurs, I think, or I hypothesize that the plant material will stay at the bottom because no oxygen was produced. The beaker that was exposed to light should have plant material floating because it produced oxygen, a byproduct of photosynthesis. After 10 minutes, I checked on the beaker that was placed inside of a cabinet. There was no plant material floating, uh, which tells me that no photosynthesis occurred. However, as you can see, the one, the beaker that was exposed to light, had the plant material rise due to the oxygen production. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this part of your virtual field trip. 
In this portion, we explored photosynthesis, the ingredients that are required for photosynthesis to occur, and the products of photosynthesis, which are glucose and that very much needed oxygen. All right, guys, I will see you guys next time. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, Mr. Dominguez. And the question came in. I think Mr. Dominguez covered it very well, but just in case he didn't, what is a byproduct of photosynthesis? The process by which green plants and some other organisms use sunlight to synthesize foods from carbon dioxide and water. Photosynthesis in plants generally involves the green pigment chlorophyll and generates oxygen as a byproduct. Thank you again, Mr. Dominguez. And now Ms. Schramm is going to talk about food webs. Good morning, everybody. I'm Ms. Schramm, and we are going to be talking all about food webs. But before I get started, I do have a friend for you to meet. Let me get her. Oh, she's a little camera shy. All right, so this is Karma, and she is my chameleon. She is a Jackson's chameleon. This is as big as she's going to get. So she's she's pretty small. Oh, she's really not liking being on camera. Um, but the reason I'm going to bring her out today is because I'm hoping I can get her to eat a few mealworms for you. So now she's crawling on my laptop. Come on, little Karma. This is her first field trip, so she might be a little nervous. But let's see what happens if she sees those mealworms. So if I'm lucky enough to get her to eat, I might have to get quiet for a second, um, you'll be able to see her tongue, which works like a big giant straw. So now she's gonna look into me. Sorry, girl. Let's see. If she doesn't eat now, we'll try again at the end. But chameleons, a lot of times people think that their tongues are just super um, sticky, but actually they work like a big long straw that's retractable. And so she sucks up her food like a vacuum. Oh, you can see she's getting really mad now. I don't think she likes being on screen. We'll try her again at the end if she can calm down. Sorry, girl. So we'll see. Hopefully she'll, hopefully she'll warm up. Right now she's just kind of like, can I go back to my cage now and go to the, the uh, heat lamp? Okay, so let's keep trying our presentation and we'll see what she feels like in a minute. Okay. All right, so at the end of my section, you'll be able to diagram the flow of energy through living systems, including food webs. So our essential questions are, what is the role of the sun in a food web? What is the role of producers, consumers, and also decomposers? Well, what is the role of the sun? Just as you learned from Mr. Dominguez before, um, the sun is the vital part of plants growing because of photosynthesis. So the sun powers producers through photosynthesis. And the sun produces so much energy, energy that if you put it in terms of mass, um, it would be 4 million tons every second. So that is a lot of energy produced by our sun. And thank goodness we have it because without it, um, the rest of the food web would not even exist. So what is the role of producers? Well, as you may have guessed, they use photosynthesis. So this is including plants, lichens, moss, bacteria, algae, all those um, plant matter, those autotrophs that create their own energy through the sun and photosynthesis. So those are our producers. And of course you can, oh my gosh, Ah, karma, she's like all over. I think she's kind of into the plants. Okay, so um, as you may guess in the name, they produce, boom, that's easy. And same with consumers, guess what they do? They consume, they eat. So primary consumers are the first consumers. These are the herbivores, the animals that consume only plant matter, like rabbits, caterpillars, cows, sheep, and deer. Um, a lot of times if you think of primary consumers, you're going to think of prey animals, um, but also they can be as big as cows and sheep and deer, right? So these are all of our herbivores. 
Then we have secondary consumers. So secondary consumers are obviously second to eat, right? So they can be omnivores, so animals that eat plant and animals. Um, so we've got our chickens and our birds. Um, we have so many chickens out here at the EEC. They love their seeds. They love um, eating whatever's in their uh, chicken feed, but it's all plant matter, right? But they also love mealworms as treats. So they love hunting for worms, um, just like birds do, right? Because they are birds, duh. But um, a lot of times I don't think of them as a secondary consumer, but they do eat so many insects and they actually are omnivores. So also carnivores are in secondary consumers. So those are, of course, animals that eat other animals. So like frogs and spiders and snakes. So even though they are secondary consumers, um, a lot of these animals are quite small. Then we have our tertiary consumers. And these are the animals that you think of when you think of predators, right? They're carnivorous predators that eat other animals. So not only do they eat other animals, they eat other animals that eat other animals. So um, these are the animals that you would think of as being on top of the food chain. So sharks, lions, eagles, owls. Um, these are tertiary or third consumers or third eaters. And then we have our decomposers. So what is the role of decomposers? Well, it doesn't matter where you are in the food web or on the food chain, um, decomposers are going to enjoy you in the end, right? So decomposers consume dead animals and plant matter and return them to the soil. So they break down the chemicals and decompose, break it down, break down the all living animals, plants or otherwise. So this includes bacteria, um, different insects, worms, beetles, fungi, all that sort of stuff. And those, like I said, it doesn't matter where you are in the food web, eventually the decomposers are gonna break you down and start again. So if we use a simple food chain, you can see just one linear progression. So a linear exchange of energy. We've got the grass that's eaten by the grasshopper, who's eaten by the frog, who's eaten by the owl, who dies and is eventually returned to the earth with the help of our worm, right? So that is just a linear exchange, but we know in an ecosystem, there's not just a grasshopper, a frog, an owl, right? It's more complicated than that. And that's where food webs come in. So food chains are really helpful in remembering the role of each animal. So we got our producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer, and decomposer. That's helpful, but we know in an ecosystem it's more complicated than that. So that comes in our um, food web. So food webs show more dynamic energy exchange within an ecosystem. So I like this one, it's very complicated, but it's also um, really organized. So we have our producers, our cons primary consumers in this level, we got our secondary consumers and we've got our tertiary consumers. So they're all broken down but you can see all those lines are the possible interactions and possible food chain examples, right? So a simpler example um, here to the left is um, kind of looks like a habitat we might have out here at the EEC. We've got our grass um, producer. It's eaten by a grasshopper who's then eaten by a frog or a bird. And that bird can be eaten by a snake, which then can eat, be eaten by a hawk. So you can see all those connecting lines are different possibilities and um, for predator and prey, right? Um, and yeah, so I have um, another example here. And once again, it's broken down into their roles, but you can see the more animals you add into an ecosystem and the more um, diverse the populations are, you can see the food web gets really, really complicated. So my little challenge to you is, um, can you create a food web for this desert biome? So we've got all different creatures in here, lizards, scorpions, uh, cacti, roadrunners, vultures, mice, foxes, eagles, tarantulas. So um, if you were here, I would have these all cut out for you and have some string um, and you could kind of map it out. But since I do not have you here live, I've got the pictures here for you. And so that's my challenge. So let me stop sharing. And I just want to see if my darling little karma feels like eating again. If she doesn't, I'm sorry.
Mostly I think she's just hissing. I wonder if she sees her own reflection or if she sees herself on my camera and now she's mad. Chameleons can be very territorial. And so she might be seeing herself on film and not being happy about it. Cause sure enough, as soon as I pull her away, she stops hissing. All right, well, I'm sorry I couldn't get her to eat for you, <laughs> but that's all right. Thank you so much for joining us and I can't wait to see you next time. Thank you, Ms. Ram. And a student asked, what is a food web? There was a lot of lines and a lot of animals on that picture. So we're gonna give a brief definition. A food web consists of all the food chains in a single ecosystem. Each food chain is one possible path that energy and nutrients may take as they move through the ecosystem. All of the interconnected and overlapping food chains in an ecosystem make up a food web. And now, Ms. Ramirez is going to do an owl pellet investigation. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez, and in this segment, we're going to be learning about owl pellets. So let me go ahead and show you what an owl pellet looks like, and then I'll let you guys guess what you think it might be. So here's the owl pellet. I'm gonna break it open just a little bit so you can see inside. So be thinking about what do you think I'm touching? Uh, so that's an owl pellet. And I do have an animal friend, although this animal friend is not alive. It's a taxidermid animal, meaning that it's the real animal. It's just not alive anymore. A person called a taxidermist has taken their time to prepare the body and stuff it so that we can use it uh, for display purposes. So this is a real owl. This is a barn owl. Uh, they get their name because they're most commonly found in the barn. Um, it is a predator. So you can see it has these big long talons to help it catch its prey. It also has these very special feathers that if you were able to touch them, they actually feel really soft. Owls are considered birds of prey. Uh, so they are excellent hunters. And these feathers allow them to have silent flight. So the poor little prey animal doesn't even know the owl is coming because they don't even hear it. So owls have a good sense of smell and sight to help them hunt during the night. So they are nocturnal animals. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you guys and we'll start that presentation. So let me get the screen share started. I do have a couple of focus questions for y'all. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to answer these two questions. The first is why do owls make owl pellets? And the second is why, or what do scientists use owl pellets for? So let's talk about what exactly an owl pellet is. Well, if you look at these little video clips, you can see that an owl pellet is not poop. Instead, an owl pellet is a regurgitated mass of fur and bones. So owls, um, when they eat their prey, uh, they actually don't chew it. So what ends up happening is all the undigestible stuff like the fur and bones gets spit back up in the form of a pellet. So again, an owl pellet is just a regurgitated mass. And so let's take a look at how that owl pellet forms. So it first starts when the owl finds its prey, like a rodent, um, it will ingest or eat that small animal and it will actually eat it whole. Uh, eventually that uh, prey animal will make its way through what's called the proventriculus, which is sort of like a stomach. Um, and again, it's moving through the owl's digestive system through what's called peristalsis. So it's just the, the movement of those organs. Eventually, the little prey animal makes its way into a very special organ called a gizzard. Uh, the science word for a gizzard is the ventriculus. And the gizzard is sort of the equivalent of avian teeth. Avian is just another word for bird. So what happens inside the gizzard is that gizzard, the organ will actually contract. So it's squeezing. And as it's squeezing, it's able to crush the, the prey animal or whatever the owl ate. And so the gizzard, think of it as like mushing up the food. Now, other animals that have gizzards would be things like chickens. Uh, so some of you guys might have eaten chicken gizzards before. I'm not really a fan of them, um, but chickens also have gizzards. Sometimes if you have a, a pet chicken or I have a pet chicken at home, you might notice that they eat little pieces of sand or pebbles um, or even little pieces of rock. When they ingest those rocks and pebbles, 
it ends its way up into the gizzard. And as the gizzard is contracting, it's helping to grind uh, the food particles and helping to break it down. So again, the job of the gizzard is just to help break down uh, the food since birds don't have teeth. Now, after it gets ground up in the gizzard, the stuff that the owl can digest that has all the nutrients continues its way through the digestive system, but all the other stuff like the fur and bones that can't be digested, they eventually go right back up from where they came from. It will eventually make its way back up through the esophagus or the throat, and then it will be spit back out in the form of a pellet. Uh, this whole thing takes place about eight to 10 hours um, after it goes through the gizzard. And in my next little segment, Here's just a variety of different owl pellets. So you can see, uh, teachers feel free to pause to allow students time to compare and contrast the pellets from these various owl species. But it's important to study owl pellets because even though we might not see an owl, if we find an owl pellet, a scientist can actually determine what owl species it came from. So for example, the barn owl that I showed you guys earlier, here's what their pellet most commonly looks like compared to other owl species. Uh, so by studying an owl pellet, scientists can determine what owls live in an area. And then here in this image, you can see how owl pellets de decompose over time. So if you're super lucky and you go hiking or maybe at your, at a park, you might see something that looks like this. This is a fresh owl pellet. Uh, they are rather hard and cylindrical in shape. But again, because it is organic matter, it's fur and bones, eventually it will start to decompose. So you can see what it looks like as it starts to break down. And then here's what it looks like eventually eight to 16 years later. So it takes an even longer amount of time for the bones to decompose and break down. And then in our next little slide, I have a quick little video of an owl pellet dissection that I did earlier. So let me play the video for y'all. This is an owl pellet. Again, it's not poop. It's a regurgitated mass of hair and bone. And for Dallas ISD teachers, you can visit our DISD EEC website and order owl pellets for your class free of charge. Now, when you do your owl pellet dissection, it's gonna come wrapped in some foil. All you do is just use your hands to remove the foil. I'm just gonna use my hands to help me break open and investigate what's inside this pellet. Uh, but you can also use tweezers if you don't feel comfortable touching the owl pellet. I will say that the owl pellets have been sterilized in an autoclave, so they're safe to touch. Um, but as always, if you have concerns, again, just make sure you wash your hands after handling these. As I'm starting to break apart this owl pellet, I'm already starting to see some bones and other remains. I even found a skull. You can see those two long yellow teeth that probably came from a rodent skull. Two more skulls that were found. Again, the most common thing you're gonna find in these pellets are probably gonna to belong to uh, the rodents. This owl happened to find himself some nice small mice to eat. And I know that these are rodents because they have these long yellow teeth. And as you're continuing with your dissection of your owl pellet, uh, just remember to pull apart as much as that hair as you can, because a lot of times smaller bone fragments are hidden in that fur. So you might find bone fragments from part of an arm or a leg. You might find some claws, a jaw bone or teeth. And there's a collection of bones that I found there. There's actually two jaw bones. So there's one jaw bone right here and there's another jaw bone further down. We also have parts of the legs that you can see, maybe a shoulder blade. Here's another rodent skull. You can see the eye socket the little tiny teeth here, and then the long front teeth or incisors. Again, here's a better close-up of the rodent skull. Now my challenge for you guys is to see if you can identify these bones. Feel free to pause the video to allow more time to make observations. You might have to do some online research, either using owl pellet dichotomous keys or search for owl pellet bone identification charts. Uh, you can even use the one that I'm going to show you at the end of this presentation uh, to see if you can match up some of these bones. Then in my next little slide, we're just going to do a quick review of where the owl fits in a food web. 
So remember a food web is a collection of food chains that show the transfer of energy. So remember with Ms. Shram, we learned that all the energy originates from the sun. So the sun is the source of all energy. The sun provides energy to our producers, also called autotrophs. And those things would be things like grass and trees. Uh, they are using energy from the sun to help them photosynthesize. So again, producers produce their own food or energy. Then we have our consumers or heterotrophs. The owl is an example of a consumer or heterotroph. It has to eat other organisms or consume other organisms for energy. You guys are examples of consumers or heterotrophs too. We have to eat other things uh, for energy. So we can see here is where our owl is in this particular food web. It is a both a predator and a prey. So it is a predator in the sense that it can hunt other things like birds and snakes and rodents, but there are other animals that might eat it as well. Then the last link we have are the decomposers. Once uh, the producers and consumers and even other decomposers die, uh, decomposers like our worms and bacteria are gonna come in and help to break it down to return organic matter back into the soil and just to help get rid of all that dead stuff. And then, of course, we know that owl pellet dissections are super important for scientists because, again, they can help identify owl species in an area. They will tell us what those owls have been eating. So it's a good, gives us a good idea of what prey animals are in the area. And pellets can also tell us about the diversity of prey in an area so that scientists can document changes in their diet and examine possible causes. Now, if you guys uh, do decide to, uh, order some owl pellets from the environmental center. Uh, the most common thing you're gonna find are probably gonna be the rodents. If you're lucky, you might find the super cute remains of this little animal called a shrew or even a mole. And some people have even found bird remains. Uh, so it really is a fun investigation. So that's all I have for you guys today on owl pellets. We're gonna give it back to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Maris. And the student wants to know if we're not part of Dallas ISD, how do we get them? You can go to carolinabiological.com and order them right straight from them. They'll send them to your teacher. Just tell your teacher, go to carolinabiological.com. And now Mr. Monroe is going to talk to us all about an energy pyramid. Sounds exciting. Good morning, everyone. We're going to be looking at, I guess you might call it a diagram that shows the energy flow within an ecosystem, within a food chain, or maybe within a food web, which you've learned about earlier. Listen, I've got a couple of real specimens that I'm going to show you before I get into my PowerPoint presentation. I'm gonna start out by showing you what you've already heard about, an autotroph, a plant. We know that that is the probably the most important part of a food chain or food web, because without the autotroph or the producers, nothing else above this trophic level is going to be able to survive. And you, you know what comes after? After that comes, then we have an insect called a grasshopper. Now, I couldn't go out and find a real live grasshopper to show you today, so I pulled one from my book collection. But the grasshopper would feed on, of course, the producer or the plant life, okay? And if that grasshopper got so close to the pond, there might be something come out of that pond or be sitting at the edge of the pond that might consume this grasshopper. And that would be an animal like this. It would be an animal like Hoppy the bullfrog because he is the type of consumer that we call an insectivore. And he spends part of his life in the water, part of his life on land. So therefore he's an amphibian, right? And you know what? Because of the size of Hoppy, if he got to swimming around in that pond and moving around in that water, there might be another consumer that would come after him. And let me show you him. An animal like or an organism like old Snappy the snapping turtle might come after that young bullfrog to consume him. And that is just part of the energy flow that goes on. 
in that particular ecosystem. Now, students, listen. As we get ready to go into this PowerPoint presentation that I prepared for you, a couple of things I want you to remember, maybe to even get out of the presentation, is the fact that at each trophic level in a food pyramid diagram, there's a certain amount of energy that is passed on. There's a lot of energy that is lost. And I want you guys to kind of remember the pattern of that, uh, I guess you may call it a reduction in the energy from the very bottom part of the pyramid. Also, there are names given to organisms that are at the very top of the food chain or at the very top of the food web, even the top of the food pyramid. There are organisms that have special names. Now, Ms. Shram mentioned to you a tertiary consumer. Snappy is a tertiary consumer. He came from our pond. That means nothing in that pond is going to be looking to consume and eat him for energy. Okay, so let's get started. I'm going to share my screen with you and we'll get started on the presentation. Well, there's an essential question. How does energy flow through an ecosystem? And of course, that's been it's been covered very well earlier through food chains and food webs. But how does the amount of energy change as it moves through a food uh, energy pyramid? And that's what we're going to be covering here. You know, again, and you might say, well, we've heard this before. Well, we're going to keep giving you this information because you know what? Sometimes we forget if we don't use information or, or frequently uh, look at it then we forget it. But anything that can make its own food to survive is called a producer. Anything that cannot make its own food must eat to survive. It is a consumer. Now, this is an image of a food pyramid. And you can see at the very base of the pyramid, we have producers. And then level two is the primary consumers. Level three is the secondary consumers. And then at the very top, we have what we call the tertiary consumers. And then on the back side, we have a nutrient, nutrient recycling group that we refer to as decomposers. Now, each one of those levels is represented, it is actually referred to as a trophic level, okay? Producers, primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers. Now, looking at an energy pyramid, the energy pyramid shows the amount of energy that moved from one trophic level to another in a food chain. The most energy is available at the producer level of the pyramid. The availability of energy decreases as it moves up the energy pyramid. The most energy is at the producer level, the very base of the pyramid, okay? And as you can see by this image, as you go up, it's decreasing energy. Now, here we have a pyramid that shows several organisms that fall into the different trophic levels. And you can see that if we look at the producer, the base of the pyramid, we see that they're represented there by 1,000 kcal. Now that kcal stands for kilocalories, okay? That primary consumer only gets about 10% of the energy from what they have consumed from the producers. So they're getting 100 uh, kilocalories of energy, okay? Now the next level, it's even reduced furthermore. They're only getting another 10%. So, wow. Boy, that, that, that's really something. that It loses so much as you go up the pyramid. And then look at the very top. That consumer, that tertiary consumer that's at the very top, wow, one kilogram, a one kilo calorie. 
Now, what that means is, boy, for that owl to really get full and get the energy that he needs, he has really got to consume a lot of organisms, right? More so than what the grasshoppers would have to do here. And again, it shows that there is high energy at the base of the pyramid. And as you go up the pyramid, the energy decreases, okay? Who needs to eat the most organisms to survive? I want you guys to be able to answer that. Simply because I've already given you the answer, because of the pyramid showing the decrease in the energy from the base to the top. Now, the energy pyramid in this picture you could basically call the lion a tertiary consumer or another name given to predators that sit at the very top of a food pyramid. They are called apex predators. Now, hopefully I've been able to help you understand about the energy flow in a food or energy pyramid. I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Gorman in case you guys have some questions that need to be answered. And I bet he can answer those for you. You guys have a good day the rest of the day. We'll see you next time. Okay. Student will ask, what is an energy pyramid? An energy pyramid is also known as an ecological pyramid. It's a graphical uh, representation of the energy found within the uh, ecological levels of an ecosystem. The bottom and the largest level of the pyramid, as Mr. Monroe said, is the producers and it contains the largest amount of energy. Thank you, teachers. We appreciated it, and we appreciate you, teachers that are watching you. And I'm going to share my screen. Uh, during this virtual field trip, students recognize that radiant energy from the sun is transformed into chemical energy through the process of photosynthesis and describe the flow of energy through living systems including food chains, food webs, energy pyramids. Mr. Dominguez talked about photosynthesis. Ms. Schramm, food webs. Ms. Ramirez did a great oil pellet investigation. And Mr. Monroe talked to you about energy pyramids. Thank you for joining us on this wonderful day. Uh, if you would, teacher, please go to www.tiny.cc slash feedback. We would appreciate your feedback on this. Thank you again for joining us. You have a great day.